So, um, Mrs. Obama, I've had time to get to know you over the last two years, and I feel so lucky in that. But being First Lady in some ways, not everybody gets yeah. to know you, and, and others tell mm -hmm. your story. Mm -hmm. How empowering is it to tell your own story? Very empowering, because you spend this time, because everyone is writing books. They want to write books. They want to get inside of you. And we were very, I was very conscious of saving my story for me to tell, you know, because it's not often that women, <laughs> let alone women of color, get to tell their own story in a way that's going to be read by millions. So even from the beginning, I felt I, I knew I would come to a place where I would need to unravel all of this. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want somebody else who didn't know me but read things about me to do that mm -hmm. um, because it's my voice, you know. So it's important for me to shape my own voice and put it out there in a way that matters to me. So this book is important for me in that way. Mm -hmm. It's been like therapy. <laughs> it has been so much like therapy. You know, it's so necessary. I mean, the first parts of the book, Becoming Me, mm -hmm. Becoming Us, you know, that stuff I it sort of worked out, right? Because as, you're, as I was growing as a professional, trying to figure out why I wanted to leave law and go into public service, who, I was marrying this man who had political ambitions. I had to think mm -hmm. through who I was and what I wanted to be before I got swept up in his tornado of whatever, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But the last eight years or the last ten years, I really, there, as you know, there's no time to reflect yeah. when you're in that whirlwind. You are doing every day. Um, and when you have kids, the, the, the moments that you're not being first lady, you're being mom, mm -hmm. full on, you know, when the kids are little. So I realized that I didn't have a moment to sit back and think, what just happened to me? And how, did that, how does that feel? And what, is that, what does that do to my life journey? And how do I reassess or add all those experiences into the, the others that I came into yeah. this with. And how, you know, how did it feel? I know from some other first ladies that the role is, yeah. is complicated in some yeah. ways. There's no guidebook. That's right. There's no pay. That's you know, right. you're working right. like crazy That's for right. something you believe in, but yeah. it's a complicated role. Yeah. How, yeah. Did, how did you find it? You know, I, your mom was helpful to me. Um, I, I did look at other first ladies and what they did. I tried not to read too much mm -hmm. about what they were doing because I knew that I had to shape this role for myself. Um, but I watched, you know, I, I write about, you know, the first time I met your mom when I was a Senate spouse and I watched mm -hmm. her at one of the Senate spousal uh, mm -hmm. luncheons that first ladies do that I now know everything about, but I attended and she sat and she took pictures so elegantly with like a hundred people. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, because I was at the end, I was like, there is no way I could do this. And you did. And I did. <laughs> and I did. Um, so I had wonderful role models in the first ladies to, to come, but you're absolutely right. But I think the beauty of the job is that it's undefined, mm -hmm. you know, because the commander in chief is dealing with crisis after crisis. I mean, they don't have the room to you know, sort of think and plan and act. A lot of times what they're doing is reactive. Mm -hmm. But as First Lady, you have the, you know, you, you have the flexibility to choose the things that you care about, that you find, uh, that give you passion and, and strength. And I think that luxury <laughs> needs to be there to counterbalance what the president has to go through. Mm -hmm. uh, so I learned to sort of live in that world of, D defining the undefined yeah. um, and I think I was good at it I think in leaving the law and going into a career of nonprofits where I had to build an organization and going into the university where I was building programs that hadn't existed before. Mm -hmm. I was used to starting from scratch and I actually thrived on a blank slate. Mm -hmm. I kind of liked a blank slate so you know, one of the things that surprised me in the book and was also mentioned, I tried to count, I think, five or six times, was this feeling of you thinking, I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. I think you mentioned it yeah. all the way through mm -hmm. adulthood. It's something that I could relate to. It's mm -hmm. something that a lot of women can mm -hmm. relate to. Do you, how do you shake it? And is yeah. it something you yeah. still have to say to yourself yeah. even now? I, I I think I'm finally gr growing into feeling like I'm, I'm good enough. It's, it's a lifetime journey for us as women because it's so, it, it's, it's imprinted on us mm -hmm. in so many ways. I mean, I, I, I describe sometimes the challenges that many women have to go through in life as cuts that we get mm -hmm. along the way, and some of them are small. 
you know, paper thin cuts. You know, maybe it's a mean word at school or jealousy or the the mean girl or maybe something more deep like physical or mental abuse or a cat call on the street or somebody groped you or said something mm -hmm. about you or maybe it's something more personal like mm -hmm. somebody telling you what you're not able to do but there's so many women we walk around with these cuts on us these unseen cuts um, and they affect us you know over the long run they define us they shape us our, our pain we slowly start feeling that you know mm -hmm. and I think that I don't think that there's a woman in the world who can't relate to this notion that somehow they don't belong mm -hmm. because the the, the world isn't set up for women, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, sadly. I mean, one of the reasons why we struggle to make sure that girls around the world get mm -hmm. an education, because so many cultures are telling them you're not good enough to even go to school. You're not worthy of the investment. You know, we're not through with that, those, you know, th those notions, not even in a country like ours. You know, anywhere we go in the world, we find women who are struggling with their own identity and their sense of purpose and their value. Uh, and I am no exception. Mm -hmm. But you're not saying to yourself, you know, I think I've enough. grown up you a little. I, I think I've grown out of it a little bit. Good. But you know what? There's still the sort of, mm -hmm. let me get this right. You know, I can't mess up. You know, mm -hmm. um, I don't have room. You know, there's still that, that, that part of me. There's a perfectionist part of me that feels when, especially when you're in seats of power mm -hmm. and people know you, 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 you want to deliver, mm -hmm. you know, so there's still that pressure. But I, you know, it's not a question of whether I'm good enough. It's just, I, now I want to be good. <laughs> <laughs> you write that when you had your girls, that motherhood became your motivator. Yeah. yeah. I love that line. Yeah. Um, I, I wonder, one of the hardest parts for my mom mm -hmm. was hearing us hearing her girls criticized publicly, mm, it mm -hmm. crushed her. Yeah. How, how was that for you? Well, I, you know, I tried to make sure that they, they weren't out there mm -hmm. to be crushed. Mm -hmm. um, but, oh gosh, it, it's, it's the mama bear in us. Um, and, you know, so we tried to set up boundaries around their exposure, um, mm -hmm. which is why you would rarely see the girls mm -hmm outside of um, public events, mm -hmm. you know, the Christmas tree lighting or getting the tree or the how there were a set of things where we sort of told the press, okay, the girls are going to be here mm -hmm. and this is the time, mm -hmm. but don't publish anything else that, yeah. don't go to the, their school, and, you know, because now there's social mm -hmm. media. Thank God there wasn't that uh, when I was Gosh, young. right. I mean, holy moly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the feeling is you, you want your kids to grow up normal. You want them to be able to have wonderful experiences privately, and you want them to be able to fail and stumble privately mm -hmm. like any other kids. And when they're not allowed to do that, it's unfair, and you, you feel guilty about mm -hmm. it, you know, because you, you feel like this is the life you chose because they didn't choose this life. Mm -hmm. So, you, yeah, you go through all kinds of emotions. They need to call me. Your brother. <laughs> in this picture in the book, um, that I love. Uh, I loved the memory of it. Yeah. I'm in such a teacher outfit. Yes, indeed. We had driven down from Baltimore. Barbara had come from New That's York. That's you guys. We taught them how to go down the banister. You're welcome. Well, and and they did that often. I know. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I think that's exactly what a mom <laughs> wants them to learn. Um, what? How have you seen your whole family? When you think back to that day before you'd even stepped yeah. in the halls of that majestic house, like how have y'all changed how have you yeah. wow well the the girls are young women now um just like you all <laughs> i mean it, it's it's, it's weird when the world sees you grow up mm -hmm. you know it's an odd thing for the world to see you transition from a child to mm -hmm. a young woman um and so they've grown up and they've had their stumbles and they have th they've had their triumphs and you know, that phase of their life is over, and I think the girls are happy about it. I, they're happy oh, yeah. to be, you know, as you know, you know, it's an honor to mm -hmm. be there, but you're fine when it's over. Um, but I, I will remember that time uh, fondly as well, because it wasn't the first visit to the White mm -hmm. House. In fact, your mom set up a second visit to make sure the girls could come back when you all would be there. You know, and you guys took that time and flew in and gave them 
the kids' tour mm -hmm. of the White House. It wasn't just sliding down the banister, but they saw the movie theater, mm -hmm. and you showed them their bedrooms, and you guys talked about the exciting parts. You made you made them feel excited about this train, strange and scary thing that was about to happen to them. You know, it's so funny because we saw they were the same age that we were when mm -hmm. my grandfather became inaugurated. So we saw ourselves. Yeah. And we saw what it's like to see yeah. the White House through the innocent eyes of children, yeah. and it is yeah. powerful. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also grounding, though. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, you know, look, I, I love your family because your family is grounded, and I think having children and grandchildren around because it keeps you focused on what's really important. Mm -hmm. You know, all the, you know, the challenges of the day that the president faces and to be able to come up that elevator and get off on that second floor and find peace. And children bring that because they're innocent. So you come home, they don't care about what crisis you were dealing with. They want to talk about the argument they had with their friend <laughs> or the questions that they have about life. And it's a calming force. You know, that's so, my, I got a text from my dad this morning that said, mm -hmm. Sin, Michelle, my love. I was like, don't you call her Mrs. Obama? He's like, no, I call her Michelle. He said, send her my love. And I thought, you know, it's so interesting how people are so interested in y'all's mm -hmm. friendship. I mean, that hug was like the hug that went around the world. Mm -hmm. I do love that picture. Yeah, but I mean, that's your dad. That's a, you, you know your dad, you know. He's, Why do you think people are so hungry for that, though? Because I think the political discourse, the way it's shown in the media is it's all the nasty parts of it you know because I guess we become a culture where the nasty sells mm -hmm. so people are just gonna keep feeding that but the truth is much more complicated and complex than that and I'd love that if we as a country could get back to the place where we didn't demonize people who disagreed with us mm -hmm. because that's essentially the, the difference between Republicans and Democrats, mm -hmm. we're all Americans, we all care about our family and our kids and we're trying to get ahead. We have different ideas about what's the best way to, to get there, you know? But that doesn't make me evil and that doesn't make him, you know, stupid. <laughs> it's, yeah. it, it's just a disagreement. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how I feel about your father, you know? He's a, he's a beautiful, funny, kind, sweet man. And I don't know that I agree with him on everything. No, or on, on much, probably. <laughs> on much. No, on no, much. You probably, Maybe not. And but actually, if we, you all had time over coffee, you might agree would. on more than you think. Right. So I think, but I think in, in, in America's heart, that's where we want to be. And I think that our relationship reminds us that we can get there mm -hmm. um, with the right leadership and with the right tone setting and with each of us giving one another the benefit of the doubt. And for me, my book, Becoming, if, if I want anything to come from that, I want us to share our stories mm -hmm. with each other. You know, because when you're not just staring, you're sharing your stats, like where'd you go to school, yeah. how much money you make, what's your job, and you get down to what, how'd you grow up? You know, who was your dad? What did mm -hmm. he mean to you? Mm -hmm. You know, if we can tap into those stories and share them with other people, then that's when we let each other in. In, in, into those vulnerabilities and we can see each other as real people. Um, that's what we're missing mm -hmm. right now. Um, and I think people are hungry for that. Yeah, they are. Yeah. When um, I wrote you a letter after, mm -hmm. the, uh, you did. after the election just to thank you for all of your work because I know it's not easy. Yeah. I want to cry. Um, I know I am too. <laughs> Please you stop us. <laughs> no, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but I also wanted to get advice about how to talk to my girls about the yeah. way yeah. that people the language that's being yeah. used. Like, yeah. What? Yeah. What did you say to your girls? You know, uh, you know, we we know how to raise our kids. You know, this this is the thing that we have to think about. We, you know, that's what we have to think as adults. Is this behavior something that we would want our two year old or four year old? You know, there are values that we understand and cut across party and race and identity and religion, you know, values of kindness and appreciation. It's like you push past that. Mm -hmm. We still have to teach our children what we know is right, you know. So in some instances you have to tell them this isn't how grown-ups behave. Mm -hmm. Don't emulate this. Watch me. Watch your mom. Watch your dad. Watch your family. You know, we have to push through it because they're the next generation, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, are your little babies, your precious mm -hmm. ones who I got to dance mm -hmm. with they the other day. With they, you. they were very good, by the way. They called my cafe <laughs> and they were like, guess who I met? I met your friend. <laughs> 
but they didn't seem to care much about no, me. I think it was Megan Trainer that they were more focused on. <laughs> Kelly Megan. Clarkson's daughter was, yes. the, <laughs> was the draw. That's right. <laughs> um, but we have to, you know, teach our kids better, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so my advice is, like, you know what's right. And everybody out there knows what's right, the mm-hmm. right thing to do. And we owe it to our kids to keep them on the right track, mm-hmm. even when their grown-ups around them behaving badly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, there's this tradition where formers don't don't mm-hmm. speak up. It's it's mm-hmm. a it's a I think it's a beautiful tradition yes. where you let people yeah. get yeah. to use their voice. Yes. But right now, this isn't a traditional. Time. Yeah, we're in a we're in a different place right now. It feels like the right, never. Right. But is it hard for you? Like, do you call friends and you're like, oh my gosh, is it hard to keep quiet, or does it feel like what's right? You know, uh, y- yes, it is because it is true. We live in a democracy. People vote, and the leadership that's in, they get to lead. Um, but so it's it's really important to strike a balance. So for me, for example, I, I chose not to campaign, mm-hmm. but to encourage people to vote, because I think that that's a message that transcends everything. I think all of us, formers, currents, knots, <laughs> we need to be encouraging everyone to stay involved and engaged in this democracy. And in order to do that, people have to be knowledgeable. And we are, we're still role models and leaders, even though we're formers. Mm-hmm. People still see themselves in us. We still have bases of people who listen to us. Mm-hmm. So for me, I still think it's my responsibility to use my voice to help people get to a better place. Mm-hmm. And for me, voting this time around, that, that was my message. Vote. It matters. You know, I don't care who you vote for. Just vote and vote every time. Vote for dog catcher. Vote for your city council. <laughs> know who your board of your who's on your board of education. Mm-hmm. Vote, um, and I, I'm going to keep saying it and saying it and saying it until it becomes the habit that it must be, mm-hmm. so that the people who get into office are the people that we all believe in, and then we then we can't complain mm-hmm. because we did our part. I watched as my parents, you know, climb the high mountain, the highest mountain, mm-hmm. and then had to transition, and it was. Yeah. It's it's yeah. awkward, but yeah. it's something you know that's happening. Mm-hmm. But it is tricky yeah. Yeah. in some ways because your desk mm-hmm. isn't mm-hmm. full of papers, yeah. and the yeah. weight of the world is now gone. Yeah. What's the transition been like for you and the president? It's been o- it's been okay. I mean, those first few years when you come out, there's still a lot to do. Mm-hmm. You know, you're writing your book. Mm-hmm. You know, Barack is you know <laughs> he's writing and writing and writing. You've got your presidential library mm-hmm. that you have to get going. So there's a lot of work to do. Uh, you know, around that. So the transition has been okay for us for now. Um, But I think the next question that we have to strike just as individuals and as a couple is what's the balance of work that we want to do? You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, formers are workaholics. Mm -hmm. You know, they are people who love to be busy. And, you know, the question that I ask my husband is, okay, let's make sure we're making time to enjoy the life that we've been working for. Mm -hmm. Um, So getting used to what that feels like and what that means, we're still working through that. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be empty nesters soon. I know. So, you you, know, look out. What type of empty... (laughs) Does that mean <laughs> things are going to go wild? Yeah, who knows? <laughs> Look out. Are no. you the empty nester that's tearing up? Or are you the empty nester that's like, oh, finally, you know? Yeah, well, you know, this is how I see it. I can feel in both of my girls that they were ready for the next step. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I would, I'm excited for them to go to their next part of the journey. So... I can't be selfish and say, oh, I wish you would stay because I can feel that they need, they, they need more. Mm-hmm. So I'm excited for them mm-hmm. because every phase they get, they get more independent, they get more autonomous. I think my girls are going to thrive in that. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of excited for them. And I told them, no matter where you go, I'll drop in whenever I need to see you. I'll, I'll find you. You know, maybe I'll look up and I'm auditing a class. <laughs> Seriously. You know, I used to threaten them like that. It's like, I can audit classes at that university. And that's university. every college girl. Gr- <laughs> well, well, just what they want. want. It's they like, dream is to see like, their mother. Just texting LOL. Yeah, exactly. Guess who's in town? <laughs> <laughs> want to go to dinner? <laughs> We're going to do a quick, quick fire. Okay. Um, what's your favorite date night? Favorite date night is always dinner. I'd rather eat than watch a movie so we can talk. So that's so, been your date night for all those yeah, years. Yeah, always going out to um, What is your t- TV show you're watching right now? 
Oh gosh, TV show. I love blackish comedy. Mm -hmm. um, I love The Crown. Oh yeah. Although that's not on right now. No, but right? That, you second. can stream things. That's yeah, I like sh streaming things. Yeah. Uh, what else? Those, what else? What else? Those are two. those are good recommendations. Okay. Um, so are, are you write about how your childhood household was always filled with music. How mm -hmm. your grandpa yeah showed you his outside yes outside <laughs> showed you his collection of records. Is it still a music household? And what are y'all listening to? Yeah, yeah. But everybody's got their own thing. You know, I mean, we have a turntable, yeah. but you know, playing a turntable requires focus. You know, whenever I'm using the turntable, the music stops, and I'm wondering. <laughs> What happened to the music? And it's like, oh, I have to change the record, you know? So so we all have our own music, mm -hmm. but yes, Sasha is big, so everybody's got their music blasting, mm -hmm. so yes. Um, what was the last thing that made you laugh? Oh, my brother, he's here, he's funny. My brother cracks me up. He's he's one of the funniest people. Don't you think siblings are such a yeah, gift? Yeah, yeah, it's just, yeah. It's such a gift. Okay, your favorite thing about life right now? Oh, freedom. <laughs> I feel you. <laughs> I was the one that had secret service with me when yeah, I got engaged. Right, I know. How do you think that felt oh, to them? Sad. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you had more time in the day, how would you use it? Oh, wow. Uh, I'd spend more time with young people. I love that. I mean, I, I had a nice roundtable conversation mm -hmm. with some seniors at my uh, alma mater, mm -hmm. Whitney Young, and just talking to young people, just hearing how smart they are and how open they are, that keeps me, I always feel hopeful when I walk away. So I try to surround myself by things. I would spend more time surrounded by things that gave me hope, yeah. and that's usually young people. What are you becoming now? Oh. Or who are you becoming now? I am still figuring that out. I am becoming uh, more confident. 